There you go. Okay, everyone, it is Gordon Einstein, your Dubai resident crypto attorney and sometimes social media guy. I have a very special guest on today, a gentleman I've just met a couple of times, but I think we kind of hit it off when we first met and sit in touch one way or another. Uh, Joel Kopshoff, am I saying this correctly, Joel? Yeah, Kopshoff. Most people know me as Coach K, including a lot of my friends don't even know my real name. I think I think from now on, I don't know, if I'll, I'll call you something. Joel, good to have you on the show. Joel, yeah, that's good. Amazing. Thank I, you for Joel and I met, I think, in 2017 or 18 in Mallorca, of all places. Yeah. On some at a conference, and then you know went off on a yacht or near a yacht, or had a restaurant. Met at a restaurant. Yeah, near a, a restaurant near a yacht or something like that. Uh, yeah, you were with you were with I think your wife and yeah, we were just. No, I, about, I, I was with my ex sister in law. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your ex sister. Okay, your ex sister in law. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. You know, hey, listen. Everything's been everything has been handled. So now yeah, we got it's been handled. Married now. Everything got. <laughs> no, she was cool. Uh, anyway, but Joel. That's a whole different video. Uh, Joel is just a, a great guy. He's he's a key opinion leader. He is someone who actually knows what he's talking about in the crypto space. And it's just very, very clearly expressed, very strongly expressed. And, and in most cases with these guests, Joel included, I like to go over their background before I talk, focus more on what they're working on now. But in this case, it's going to be a little bit different because your evolution, your your life story, your lead up is the story. Because it's been so amazing, your journey and the, the community you built over these years and the impact you've had and the lifestyle you made in terms of where you're living and the fact that you're, I mean, dare I say it, you know, a family man and doing a good job with that. I mean, it's all, it's all, this is going to be like a holistic lifestyle kind of show. So, Joel, welcome on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Gordon. Uh, it's been a while since we chatted. Like last time I said, I saw you, you were like in like 30 people. I was a little busy. I was in a crowd. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was like, hey, Gordon is like, oh, we haven't seen you from America. <laughs> that was pretty much it. Yeah. yeah um, you know, I got, I got my thousand followers on, uh, on Instagram and I got all excited about myself. Uh, hey, okay, Joel, I always do yeah. this. Where, where are you from? Where, you, where were you born? I was born in Toronto, Ontario. I'm a Canadian boy. A. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I left Canada like uh, 13 years ago. Um, I moved to Korea. Was a teacher You're skipping all the good parts. Where okay. did you go to school? I went to school twice. I went to school Ottawa U, played football in college. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And then I finished my degree in kinesiology and leisure and rec as a minor and then went again to school for teaching education. So I got an education degree after that. And then uh, there was no jobs in Toronto at that time. So I was a personal trainer and then I was like, I should go work somewhere. And my, uh, at the time, my step aunt was like, you should go to Korea. There's lots of great jobs. Huh. I was like, I'm not going to Asia. That was my, my first thing was like, I'm not going to Asia. That's crazy. It's so far away. And then I'm like, you know what? We'll try it out. So I, that's, that's where I started my teaching journey. Went to Korea, was working there. It was very intense, the, 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 the roles. And then I came to Thailand after so, that. So uh, what, what, what were you yeah. teaching in Korea? Korea was teaching uh, kindergarten PE, uh, okay. so that was kind of not really my thing, to be honest, because I was more of a high school teacher. I was certified to teach older kids, and I'm much more impactful with, like, young adults than I was with, like, little kids. But I was really good at it, too, so I really like kids anyway, so it wasn't hard. Sure. But when I moved to Thailand, I was teaching, um, you know, middle school. Didn't really, like, really like doing that, but it was, I just love the lifestyle. Your people super friendly. It was, like, great, like, your quality of life is very good for, you know, you don't, even, you don't have to make a crazy salary to live a good life. So that was where I started. I was, like, you know, making, I don't even know, like, 30 grand a year U.S., uh, mm -hmm. and I was happy with that and good to go. And then I moved on to the international schools, got a good, better opportunity. Then I was teaching what I like teaching. So, so I was it, teaching. You were in uh, Bangkok? Yeah, I was in Bangkok, uh, a British, a British a Canadian, British Columbia International School. So I was working there and I was teaching like business and I was coaching sports, basketball. Uh, and I was also like teaching drama and history. So those are like kind of my teachables. That's where I liked, felt comfortable teaching and really like help the kids understand. I was really good with the at-risk youth. So like the kids that are difficult in everyone else's class, they just got better marks in my class because I just I understand people and I think it's really important in business too. So, you know, I was teaching my kids you're, business. You're kind of rambunctious like, oh. also. So maybe, maybe yeah. the rambunctious kids could respect you because you weren't like, I think you're pretty assertive, right? And you're, a phys and you're yeah. into physical coaching. So you're, you gotta be strong. You probably had a different kind of relationship. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I connected really well with the kids that were difficult because I was one of the kids in high school that was difficult, right? So I just understood them and I would be really real with them. I didn't play the whole fake teacher, talk to them like they're little kids. I'm like, you're an adult. I'm gonna talk to you like an adult. You're screwing up and tell you you're screwing up like and be honest with you and be like, look, this is all you have to do to pass this class. Like just try doing like the respect level made the kids work harder in my class than other ones because everyone else would make them feel bad. I'm like, no, nah, man, like, you can get a B in my class. And if you can do that, that's great. Like you could probably do it in all your classes. You just have to try. And then I showed them that they're a lot smarter because a lot of time it's self-esteem issues in high school. Yeah. Um, and then just like built people up. I've always been a big person on like building people up around me. Um, so when I was teaching kids, like it was really natural for me to do that and work with like the hardest kid in the school that everyone didn't have any connection to. You know, they're like, how does he get a B in your class? And I'm like, he just wants to work harder because he likes me. And that's what I also had that experience when I was in school because I a lot of kids are ADHD and they just don't have the pain, the, the attention span to just listen to you talk to them for the whole time. You need to give them stuff to do. Um, so that that was kind of like um, at the same time as when I was teaching in Thailand. Uh, I moved to I moved here. It was like the second day I was here. The teachers were talking okay, about Bitcoin. Say, just for the audience, where's here? Uh, in Thailand. So now I'm in Phuket, but I was in Bangkok. So I moved to Bangkok, working okay. at school. At school, the first day I was there, they were talking about Bitcoin. And the only times I've heard it before that were my friends talking about it on Silk, like buying drugs from Silk Road. And I, at the time, like I'd never done really any drugs. So I was an athlete. So I was like, okay, well, uh, I don't really know what they're doing, but I didn't think it was something legit. But when sure. the teachers were talking about it at the school, I was like, I, I don't have a lot of money. I'm a teacher, but like, let me buy $500 with Bitcoin. And at the time, Bitcoin, I, they gave me a price of $143. They had mined it on their laptops, right? Because it was 2013. They'd mined blocks from themselves. I was wanted 500 bucks. They're like, sweet. They've been getting it for free. So they didn't care. So they sold me a little bit, opened a Bitcoin core wallet. And that was like the start of my journey. And I didn't really look at crypto that much for like till 2016, at the end of the year or so. And then I saw Bitcoin was $800 and I was like, holy shit, I made money. And honestly, I always tell people like, if you want to get someone in who's not in crypto, gift them some crypto, let them see it grow. And instantly they'll be like, wait a minute, this is interesting. I want to learn more about that. So I think it's a really good way to like entry people in by giving them what they want, which is money. And then it's like, then you can give them what they need. Cause they're like, what is this stuff? So you know, I realized that. Percent, Cause I, I've, I've subconsciously emulated you. Cause when I go on my travels, like to Argentina or wherever, I have people install wallets on their phones and then I send them $25 with the crypto. I figure it's like a Johnny Maybe. Appleseed kind of approach because even if they don't fully understand it, the act of just installing an app and receiving it without an intermediary, without, without typing in their name or social security number yeah. or whatever. And then, you know, I give it to one guy and, he, and then he gives it to his wife sitting at the same table and they just met me. I, mean, they, I, I see the, I see the light bulb go off. And so I, I think it's a good way to, to spread the vibe. I mean, you're right. It's the action that does it. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't have any Bitcoin, I probably wouldn't have cared in 20, late 2016. But because I had some of my friends were telling me it's $800 and I've yes. now made a bunch of money from it. And I'm still a teacher, right? So like some people see me now and they're like, but you post like a million dollar trade. And I'm like, yeah, but I started with 20 grand in crypto. I actually started with 500 technically with, 20, with 500. And I added, I've only ever put in the market $20,000. And ever, everything else has come from investing that mm -hmm. 20K and it going up and taking profit and putting it in other places and I teach other people how to do this too. So I was like, a lot of Love people it. think it's impossible to get to where I'm at, but I'm like, I, anyone could have done what I did. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's just learning to manage your emotion. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah, right, so go, like, go on with your journey. Yeah. So then basically 2016, um, you know, I start going like to look and try to learn more about crypto. And at that time, you know, it was basically just people shilling everything. No one really knew what the hell they were talking about. So I was like, maybe I should learn this because I'm a teacher and I can explain it to people much easier. And then if I'm explaining it to a lot of people easily, then more people understand it. And then that will actually help them get started too, like I did. And so that's what I started doing on more educational content. I missed the YouTube bang at the start. I was on Facebook for some reason. I didn't, I didn't have the, the knowledge back then. I was just trying to get the, the word out there. So I was in Facebook groups and had a couple hundred viewers on every on every stream. And then at the end of that cycle, I went on to YouTube, but I was a little late. So people didn't discover me. I didn't really get discovered that much by many people, but I had a small tight knit uh, group of people and then started a DAO uh, in 2017, hmm. started investing in projects, learned a lot that about projects and how they're not real and how that none of the teams really understood business fundamentals while I was teaching high schoolers. These guys didn't understand that. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I started applying myself to the industry and saying, you know what, let me help you with your business. Like, cause you don't know how to plan it. You don't know how to plan your business. You don't know how to like think about a token, how like all the businesses and all the tokens should have a model like, that, that brings money and captures money back to the token. Otherwise it's just another hex, which is just like fake money that prints more fake money and has no actual product or service or anything behind it. Uh, you know, stuff like that, I just don't respect because I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't think it really makes any sense to anyone who's even in it, to be honest, they're just there for the money. So yeah, that was kind of like my stepping stones in the crypto. And then it was like working with the first few projects that I did, I saved a few projects who wanted to keep all their money in ETH in 2018. They're like, we're going to keep everything in ETH. And I was like, dude, you have people to pay, you have employees, like you have a company to run, like ETH can drop. Like I've been in the cycle before, ETH can drop. So you should be very, like, very careful because you have $300 ETH right now. It went to, I think like 80 bucks, right? So like yeah, you would have yeah. basically had no money left and you would have failed. Your company would die. Uh, one of those companies was Veracity. And last cycle, because they listened to that advice and didn't, didn't keep it all in ETH, they came back and did like 400x in last cycle. So they crushed it. Uh, and that's when I was like, okay, now I need to apply myself more. So, you know, as I was working in crypto, I left teaching because I had like a boss that I just fucking hated going to work for because he was an asshole. Uh, and, and that was the, really what it is. Like, okay, folks, I didn't want to work the family with show. I'm not responsible for what he said. Sorry, you can bleep me out, but he was not a nice person and he made me there feel bad go. about myself. And he also like, I'll put it in perspective, like this guy would tell me that he didn't trust my judgment, even though the thing that he said that for, I've been doing for six years with, without ever having a kid get injured or having anything bad happen to anyone. Okay. So, you know, if you've ever had a boss like that, it, that's what drives you away from something you love. Like I love teaching, but at the same time, I didn't like how I felt going to my working day. So Crypto okay. empowered me to leave that environment that was toxic and go in to be my own boss, basically. Oh, you know, so in that, the long run, God bless him. Yeah. You know, he actually said this to me one time. He's like, you might thank me for this. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I do now. But he still wasn't a nice person and he wasn't nice to me. But I don't really care. I'd learned how to be a better boss for my employees. I treat them all differently because of that experience myself. So, yes. again, thank him for that as well. You can say that's positive. But... Yeah, that's what drove me into crypto full time. And then uh, I started like I was a trader as well from high school. So I tried to make a trading system. Oh, sorry, sorry, actually... sorry. That's interesting. So before yeah. crypto came out, you were a trader. What, what were you trading? I was trading like TSE stocks, Canadian Stock Exchange, TSX, sorry, uh, stocks um, yeah. from high school. Did competitions in high school and like got like ninth in the country. I was really good at trading. I understood like, what to look for from a fundamental perspective. I didn't know how to do TA yet. Taught myself TA over, um, you know, from 2017 to 2021, I really like honed in on my strategy. And now like, you know, I just, I know what's going to happen in the markets before it happens. And I've been calling tops and bottoms of macro trends mm -hmm. for a while now. Like that's what I do. I don't trade every single day in and out. I'll let bots do that. But actually the idea of Unibot and all these other bots that came out this cycle, mm -hmm. I actually developed that in 2018, 2019. Uh, and the only reason it didn't take off is because there was no liquidity in the markets back then. And uh, it just was too early. So that code and everything that died with that company, unfortunately, because we already had like a web-based interface where you could log in, check all the trades that the, the system was making for you. It would track everything, um, you know, had risk management built in so you didn't like screw up and take too much risk and lose all your account. So that was really cool. It was working on Binance. We're integrating other stuff. Just Capital ran out from doing that because I had to fund it myself at that point. So nice. I was like, you know what, let's stop doing this. And then the market came back a few months later. Uh, and then we went through a whole cycle. And then only this cycle was that something that became a trend, the Telegram trading bots. So I was just- hey, let, let, let back up. So you, you're, you're asserting, I know this may be like, duh, obvious. You're, you're asserting that technical analysis, A, works, and B, works in crypto. And Absolutely. That you, you can beat the market with enough well-applied skill. From this area yes okay. i would say like i would say like this if if you're trading on a 15 minute chart you're probably not going to be a winner let's put it that way if you're trading on a macro trading perspective of i'm going to deploy at the bottom of the market i'm going to dca in as it goes lower and lower once it hits 80 draw down from the top uh and then i'm deploying these assets which are fully vested you have a, you have to have like a lot of things that you think about where you're going to put your money but basically a macro trading strategy is one that I think this can do 10x, 20x in the cycle. It's highly liquid. I'm going to put money into that and I'm going to sit here and wait. 
And then I trade on the daily. So someone asked me like, how many trades do you do in a month? And I'm like, sometimes one or two, sometimes 12, 13, but I never really do a ton of trades in a month because I wait for my perfect trade because I'm very patient. Most people are trying to trade and over trade and that's why they lose a lot of money because mm -hmm. they're trying to force trades every day because they think they have to. When really the ultimate thing is being patient and getting into trades that make the most sense and that have the highest probability of winning. Now, the only way you'd learn that is by trading. So you're not going to do like be a great trader until you're like three, four years in and spending 10 hours a day looking at charts and you know exactly what to see because it's the same pattern over and over and over again. Um, and you, you also understand that you're not going to win every time too. So if you understand that it, if you win 50% of the time and you're doing risk management properly, you're still making money every month, even being wrong half the time. So it's really like understanding that and, and looking at a long-term perspective versus trying to like make money quickly and, and losing it also very quickly. So it's like so I always tell people- you know, Just approach, so everyone watching this is, is getting up to speed because I've toyed with the idea, but you're talking about three or four years of dedication, long days before you master the skill at least. Yeah, yes. like any skill, right? Yeah. Any skill, it takes 10,000 hours of practice, right? So if you're 24 sure. hours in a day and you work 10 hours a day and there's 365, like you do the math, it takes three, four years. Like if you're doing 10 hours every single day, you're not going to do every day. So let's say you do eight hours a day, five days a week, do over four years, you're going to hit 10,000 hours. And then the other thing is not not changing your trading strategy, which is what people do. They're like, have a good run and then they have drawdown and they're like, I need to change the new strategy. And then they go into those and then they start losing a lot more money because they're not just following one. If you know a trading strategy on average hits 60% of the time and you're making three times as much money when you lose, that's a pretty great trading strategy, but it may not be profitable every single month, but you'll have months where you go super profitable. So it's about the long term. It's a marathon. It's not a race. Yeah. And you go broke really quickly in crypto or like if, if you're trying to make money quick, you go broke quick. If you try to make money slowly, you stack on stack on stack and that's how you get to wealth. All right. You know what? I, I found a whole dopamine rush when you said that's how you get to wealth. <laughs> wealth is, is my trigger word. You know, that's where I, that's where Pavlov kicks in. So, okay. Yeah. This is fascinating. So keep, keep, keep going. I, I, I want to trace how your following grew or how you got yeah. your community growing and your channels and everything else. Cause here you are a guy, you know, in, in yeah. Thailand, you know, you discover this, you go down your path. How did you, how did you form your, your tribe? I mean, that just, that just takes time, you know, like consistency. Oh, sorry, sorry. let me get back up from that. How did yeah. you decide to form a tribe? Oh, uh, well, because I was focusing on education, first thing and foremost was I need to educate these people that are out there that actually want to be educated. And then I found a lot of people that did and everyone wanted to learn how to make money. And then I showed them how to do that. And then I showed them my strategy and let them apply it. And they started to make money. Um, I'll get to like the good part, the juicy parts uh, a little later, but people that know me know I've done some pretty crazy stuff, not just for myself, but for other people as well. So I just brought in a bunch of people. Um, you know, when I first started the DAO, it was like really just let's get a group of good people together. Let's, you know, let's invest in projects together, um, you know, and then like so let everyone choose what they want to put their money into. But I'll give them the whole the whole rundown and I'm investing in this. So like if they want to come in, let me give them access to that. Right. So. That was kind of like, you know, build a DAO, let them vote what they want to invest into. And then if they want to invest, they can do it. You know, we, we made money, we lost money on some, but ultimately I kept educating everyone and like obviously teaching them about my trading strategy for free. Like I don't charge money. I don't do like, I have a course, but I don't charge money for the course. It's just like come into my network and then you have the course for free. You have access to me. If you need to ask questions, I'll answer them. Normally I won't because there's just too many people messaging me. So they get like a little bit of a, they always do. They always have more access than everybody else so that they could learn. Um, so that's why they were there. And then, you know, just people talk. And then, you know, it came back to like working with the projects and then applying myself, like being out there, right? Like everyone's always like, how do you connect with all the people? How do you build a network? I'm like, go to conferences, talk to people, work the room, meet people who will introduce you to other people and mm -hmm. just like start networking because your network is your net worth. Like you, if, if you took all my money away today and I still know what I know and who I know, and I don't screw anyone over, I'll make it all back again. It might take me a lot longer. So I won't have as much to start with, mm -hmm. but knowing that I can add so much value to the space. Sure. I might not have millions of dollars overnight, but I know I could do it if I started back at zero. And so I think that's like something that I took away from it all is like applying yourself, learning the stuff that you don't know as well. 
and becoming knowledgeable and then sharing the knowledge for free so that other people can help grow the space. Because, you know, in, in the web two the world, it's like everyone's competing. There's so much money in there. There's only so little room for growth, which is why it's kind of boring for people like myself and probably also like yourself. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when you go into the crypto and you're at two trillion, two and a half trillion dollar market cap, ESG markets are $40 trillion alone. So that's just one industry. I look at that and I go, well, if we're the future of finance, everyone's going to make so much money anyways. So what do we have to compete for? Maybe we should try to help each other out. And so that's always my goal. I can teach other people about crypto. They're going to tell their family. They're going to tell their kids. They're going to tell their mom, their uncle, their aunts, everybody, which is what I've done as well. And then we get them involved in the crypto scene. Right. And then and then they tell their friends, oh, I'm involved in crypto. And then it just starts to, to, to now, obviously, BlackRock and everyone is going to open up a whole group of people. But before and still now, in my opinion, it needed to be spread to people and need to learn and educate them. So I thought that was the most important part of our industry, which was lacking is let's educate people why they're buying a token and what the value is in it versus like just go buy it and, and moon and everything, you know, like like meme coin season is always really fun. But like we all know that that's going to like eventually at some point come back down to reality and then money is going to go into real projects. You know what? Right? I, mean, I just don't understand meme coins and don't explain it to me. I, I love I love yeah. that part of what you're doing and you described it before is the tokenomics and the real business operations of these things. Or, you yeah. know, maybe being meme coins makes sense to me, but it's not for me. You know, what, what's, what, yeah, what yeah. I'm for is layer ones that or things built on layer ones that change the world, that make sense. Yeah. that can move our brick and mortar world into a digital global world that we can trust and work with and build further on top of. Cause you know, Absolutely. I want to, I want to see the future while I want to see the future arrive. You know, and I don't yeah, think we get us there. I think these other things do. Just well, I think again, education, right? If everyone understands why they buy something or what a value is, then it becomes a lot more empowering for them because now they know why they buy it, what the value is, et cetera. So that's what I teach people. I'm like, okay, let's look at a financial model. So you don't have a product, you don't have a service, so you don't make any money. So you have gas fees. Okay, how much are your gas fees? If there's a lot of gas fees, you're not going to make a lot of money. So that's not really that important. You need other factors to, to drive value and drive capital into the company or to the blockchain or however they set it up. Because there's sometimes companies, sometimes it's just a DAO, et cetera. But understanding that you need a product or service that makes money that goes back into the token so that the token actually has some sustainability because if all you do is give out tokens every month to all your investors or give out tokens to validators and there's no actual capture of value back then all it does is devalue it like the us dollar has been devalued by printing more and more all the time yep. so the second you understand tokenomics that way you go wait a minute i have 10 percent of my tokens it's up 100x so i'm up 10x when they give me 90 percent more tokens the value of that token, unless people keep buying like crazy, is going to go down, right? So that simple strategy, like just understanding that, no, it makes you know how to actually like trade the token, how to invest, how to do everything. So I look at that first and foremost, and then also look at who's involved in the project and like what have they done before? Uh, are they crypto native? Are they not crypto native? Uh, you know, are they coachable? Are they not coachable when you're talking on the phone? Uh, can you ask them questions that are hard and they can answer them properly? So I start asking a lot of different questions that people don't like funds don't even ask the questions I ask, but I try to figure out, can you, you actually example, build just for context? Like I'll go to a project and be like, how do you make, how does your project make money? And then how does that money that you're making go back into the token? Right. I was expecting something super believe. esoteric and here you are with, with the most basic question that everyone should be able to answer. Honestly, they can't. I would say like, I would say like one in three projects I asked this question to start saying the market maker, like that's the answer sometimes that I get. Okay. So for example, there was a project, I'm not going to name names that came to me and said, I'm going to give uh, money away for people trading. I'm going to give money away for people selling NFTs. I'm going to give tokens away for this and give tokens away for that and give tokens away for this. And I said, that's great. So where do you actually capture value and how much do you buy back off the market so that like you can sustain this giving away of tokens so that you, your price doesn't go to zero basically over time. And the guy was like, well, we have a good market maker. And I was like, no, no, no. I asked you, where does the money come from to actually buy the tokens from the market to continue your sustainability from your debt, from this giving away tokens every time they do actions, right? And the guy was like, yeah, but the market maker. And this is an answer I get at least 30% of the time I talk to good projects too. Like sometimes I'm like, how did the, I have projects I meet and I'm like, how did a fund give you money? It doesn't make any sense to me. It's like spray and pray. You can figure this out pretty quickly. Like some of the BRC ecosystem projects, 
this makes absolutely no sense. I don't understand why you would do this. Like this is worse than last cycle's gaming projects, but you're doing this now on BRC yeah. and it's going to be a big thing. So yeah, I'm very practical. And I think that most of the time it's just about giving me an allocation. It's not really about what do you do, doing DD on the team? What have they done in the past? Uh, are they successful entrepreneurs? Are they successful entrepreneurs in crypto? Uh, do they have the right connections? Can they actually get listed on a good exchange? Do they have the right people involved? Um, are the advisors actual advisors or just placeholder faces for people to raise money? Yep. Um, you know, you do a thousand pitches while you've been in the space as long as I have and you have, you know, you start smelling it. You're like, something smells off. Something smells off about this project. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I, if I don't get excited, I won't invest. If I don't understand it, I won't invest. So, but I mean, um, what we're saying is like basic, you know, I, I have my legal background, obviously. And it, you're, you're talking about basic due diligence questions that you would ask in any corporate acquisition or investment, you know, yeah. which is, you know, who who's who's on your board? Who are your key employees? Yeah. What's your idea? Do you have a board? <laughs> Do you even have a board? <laughs> yeah. What, 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 what are your controls? How do I know these numbers yeah. are real? Yeah, the, yeah, that's that's, that's that kind of stuff. <laughs> Show me the numbers, and they're like, "Yeah, we have the numbers. We what we raised." I'm like, "Yeah, but where's the money? How much money do you have left?" You know, and they don't answer these type of questions very easily. Well, so that's you, know, you, that, you know, how much did you raise versus how much do we have? Then they then they get yeah. real quiet, right? <laughs> they get real quiet. You're like, "Wait a minute, you raised thirty mil, and you you had a bear market, which makes sense. You probably spent like five of that on your staff and everything." They're like, "Yeah, we have like three mil left," and you're like, "How?" How, whose pockets did that go into? Please, can you explain where the money went? Mm -hmm. So like, that's like a whole different type of subject. The point I'm trying to get at is to find like, and, and do what I do, I really just have a lot of experience and, and I try to share that with people. So, you know, my group, I share it with them. I, I tell them why projects that they think are going to be so amazing are going to not do well. And it's really, they don't have a product or service that's actually going to drive enough value to mm -hmm. the project. So, when we when I'm working with Gunzilla, yeah, sorry, Joel, example, where, where is yeah. this group? And we'll put it in the show notes also. But where? Yeah. Telegram. Um, it's on Telegram. Uh, it's run for seven years. Uh, we started it off called the Coach K Future Millionaires Club. I told them when we hit a hundred millionaires in the club that we will change it to the Millionaires Club. We actually did that last cycle. So we had 130 of them become millionaires last cycle. Mm -hmm. That was like the really awesome thing. It actually made me depressed because I thought that was going to take my whole life, and it took like two years. Um, so I think I guess like for I you. learned a value about goals that I need to set them higher or something but you know that that was something that taught me a lot like you can do a lot more than you expect I was a teacher making 50 grand thinking it's a good salary to the point where you're making a million dollars in a day and you know a lot of people value money way too much something that I learned when you don't have money you value it so much and when you do have money you're like okay there's a certain point where it's really nice to have makes life easier but if you have like $20 million, it does not affect your life if you have 1 million or 20 million, 20 million. Like really, if we have a house and you have a million dollars in the bank, you're still happy. You, you Maybe 20 mil is nice to have. But what I'm saying is at one point, it doesn't make you happier. It's just you have comfort. Brother, I, 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 sorry, I think this because you're living in, in Phuket. Okay, if you're in Dubai, there is a dramatic difference between 1 million and 20 million. Sorry. Okay, true. <laughs> true okay if you're in new york or or dubai or la or somewhere like that sure 20 million but what i'm saying is like to your actual quality of life and happiness it doesn't yes. really affect that much once you have all your bills paid your kids are okay your house is paid like when you're not actually worrying about paycheck to paycheck and you have yeah, like, I, I, no, I, I i agree with you i agree with your general yeah. point once you're once you, once the bottom of your maslow hierarchy is handled and you're at the top dealing with spiritual stuff the extra buck doesn't make yeah. a marginal difference. I I, I get it. Yeah. I'm just saying to, okay. to handle the bottom seven eighths of your Maslow pyramid, the cost of that is different depending on your geography. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. But what I'm trying to get at is money is not everything. Is what you learn. You sure. learn that there's like higher reason for being on Earth and just making billion dollars. Like, could I make a billion dollars in life? I think I actually can. People have told me I will. I but think, I like, think you will for the next not, couple of cycles. Yeah, for, I for sure, I for sure will. But the point is, is like, even when I get there, I don't think I'm going to change how I dress, how I live. It's not going to really change who I am. It's because it hasn't already. It's just like, it just makes some things easier. And I think for me and a lot of the crypto OGs that I talk to, at least that have been around as long as I have, it's about like getting that capital so we can use that capital to like change a lot of the things that are in the world that don't really make sense anymore. Like, if you have a lot of very wealthy people in one room, 
the world, and I think a lot of people would agree right now, the world's pretty messed up. There's something that needs to change. Um, and, you know, someone has to do it. And right now the leaders of this world are not doing it. They're actually perpetuating it. So, uh, you know, how do we get back to, you know, what I'm not saying there's any right or wrong way to do it, but I think there's definitely things that are way out of whack at this point sure. and we need to do something. And I don't think the people that are in charge right now care about people that much. I don't think like the I, leaders I, I'd say the maybe even anti-human. Exactly. Maybe they're trying population control. I don't know. But all I know is Something like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. I just think that if you get a lot of people very wealthy and there's a gigantic wealth transfer, which is what crypto is, you're going to have people that have a different mindset about the world and where we should be going towards. And I think what we're going through right now is like an anti-family, anti-love, hate everything, everything you people do, you should hate on them and like never be positive um that needs to go like people just need to live in, and let live and no one should care about what you do in your personal life like it shouldn't be their business in your personal life so, yep. yeah and you don't need to shove it let me pick up one thing because i always i always raise my eyebrow when i hear this is crypto the yep. largest wealth transfer or is it the largest wealth creation it's not the same thing well well i would say is this Money is exiting the financial systems into crypto. So it's an exodus of liquidity from one system into another. Okay. That would make more sense. And, and I think you're seeing that with the BlackRock ETF and all the other ETFs with how much money they're sucking into Bitcoin just alone. Like you're talking and like even BlackRock CEO uh, Fink was talking about like he's never seen this type of liquidity on any ETF ever like it's the craziest amount of value transfer ever so wallet creation is probably both i guess if you if i can answer you that properly is we're creating wallets we're, we're banking unbanked we're making anyone able to control some assets um you know i work with ekify at, as a cso we let people do crypto right like e ekify one, like brad yasser like brad yasser yep he was just on the show. Okay, I see. I, I, oh, that's what I love doing these videos. He, he is a longtime friend. I did not know you guys were connected. Yeah, he, he's this a longtime friend. Actually, we were, just, okay. we were at the Toshi Roundtable together this year. Uh, spent a lot of time together as well. Um, so I've been where I've known Brad. Bro, I, I'm sorry, Dana. I was with him since the D10E days. I worked with him. Wow. We were in Karma in Los Angeles together. That's super funny. Amazing. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, you so, know, what? now I love you. If you're on Ekapi, I love perfect. you. <laughs> Yeah, so I came in to kind of like make things easier from like a product perspective. And we're working on that now. Just like, you know, people need other options. Banks are closing people's accounts for no reason because they do a $10,000 transaction. And they're like, what are you doing it for? Crypto. A week later, you get a letter. Oh, we don't support what you're doing. But that's because value is transferring out of the bank and into Bitcoin, which they don't have control of. Right. So I think that's why the put there's pushback from governments because governments want to control the US dollar. They want to control us and stuff. I think they're going to be able to figure it out anyways with crypto. It won't be 100% private, but you're in control of your assets. But you're seeing what's happened in the UK now where they're like, oh, you can't have a wallet of your own basically without doing KYC on it. That's so they're always going to know. Well, the, I think you mean the EU and yes, it's yeah. a nightmare. It's a nightmare, and, I, and I, I think that was a bad decision. They don't quite say what everyone's saying they think they say, but it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. And like, you know, privacy and, and, and autonomy of your own capital is what crypto is what predicated on. Is like no one should be controlling all your assets in a bank, which can go belly up, and then they'll give you a very small portion of what you actually had in the bank, right? Yep. That's why anyone who, had, anyone who tells me they have a million dollars in a bank account, I'm like, you're crazy, like... You're only getting 250 back if that bank fails. And we just saw the biggest bank failure since 2008, this last, like, what, two years ago, three years That's ago. Valley, yeah. In China, yeah, it's so, going a little sketchy. Yeah, China is another one where I'm like, I think they're going to have another global financial crisis probably at this time or a little bit later this time next year. I think we'll see stocks and everything just kind of implode a bit. Maybe. So we just look, look, allow me, I, I'll give you a perspective. Yeah. I, I, yeah. The transfer thing, I wonder about because you know when you, when someone buys a Bitcoin with with fiat, that fiat isn't destroyed. It's not like there's a universe where like you know this object passes from this universe and here. You know it's the basic principle that matters neither just created nor destroyed. It just changes its form. So I'm I'm not sure that it's transferred in a in a sort of destructive sense. What what I what I think 
can happen, which makes me excited, is there's a lot of friction and inefficiency built into the analog world, which is partially alleviated by going digital. And then when you go to a global world like blockchain, and sort of the internet was a precursor to this, anytime you have a global system where you're not having national boundaries, where you're not having language or translation issues, where you lower transaction fees and pick up speed, you're freeing, if you like, more energy to create more wealth. So I, I'd argue it, it's, yeah. they, there's, what makes me, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit excited about the wealth transfer, but you know, I always think about it, who's it being transferred from. I don't know if I'm thrilled about that, but what, what, what gets me excited is new wealth being created. Because then you don't have to like redistribute it; you just make it. And there, I think there's a that's a bright future. Yeah, but like it's still like the wealth that's being created is you create a token. Someone goes in, like if it's new money coming in, they print it through Tether. Tether prints a bunch of money that goes into their treasury from you giving them money. They give you dollars, and then you take those dollars and you put them into this token. So like the value is actually coming from the fiat system sure, for sure, the most sure. part. So it, it's like a vacuum. It's like sucks it into one and goes into the other. And like people that go into Bitcoin don't really sell it like ever, right? Like I don't think I've ever sold like more than half my Bitcoin at any time ever because I just hold it and then I sell some and I short and then I buy more back every cycle. It's kind of how I, I operate. But yep. um, it's the, the goal is to actually hold Bitcoin because it holds value better than the dollar. And gold, yeah, but, especially- but by far. <laughs> By far, like gold, you could have bought 10 years ago for the same price. It is just about a little bit the same, a little bit higher than the same price. But if you look at like inflation, you've actually lost money holding gold. It wasn't yeah. a great Okay, value. now you're saying uh, you want to hit. What, what's it like being a KOL? Key opinion leader. Um, I feel like there's very few of us that actually are key opinion leaders. A lot of us are there and like they're kind of just shilling stuff, which is fine. That's that's a role that they have to play. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. You, you, actually, you actually led to a better question. What is a key opinion leader? Yeah, so in my opinion, and it'll, it'll differ from a lot of people, but my opinion, a key, a key opinion leader is someone who doesn't just come in and talk about your project. It's someone who adds value to the project. So they can educate other people about the project. It's mm-hmm. not about trying to get people just to buy a token. I don't ever tell anyone what to buy. I tell people this is what I'm doing. You want to do it, it's on your own. Do it. You can copy me. I might be wrong sometimes. That's going to happen. It is what it is. But <clears throat> key opinion leaders, like in my, from what I do is you're almost an advisor. You're someone who's a leader. You're someone who's experienced. You're someone who people ask for your opinion, not just to shill on a project, but actually how do we do something? You mm-hmm. have a lot of experience. You, you're like an advisor, basically. Like you're someone people come to for advice. How but, do but, I do uh, something? But, I, th- I think part of what makes an KOL different from an advisor. By the way, I, I heard this term a year and a half ago, two years ago, and, I, and it's so far from my world. I like I, it'd be nice to be a KOL if I actually understood what they've been meant. Like I understand mm-hmm. advisor, I understand influencer, like social media influencer. Yeah. Though heaven forbid, you know, I don't think it, anyone's following me. The you know a KOL is like a crypto influencer at the most base level. Like what what the heck is this thing? And why, why did I mean, it get so important? Back? I think it's another word for influencer, to be honest. Like, okay, fine. It's, pretty, it's pretty much interchangeable for most people. When they say KOL or influencer, they mean the same thing. Most At least in crypto, that's pretty much what they mean. Um, and they've kind of now just called crypto influencers just KOLs. I, I, it's what they say everywhere. Everyone I, everyone I look, it's never an influencer. It's a KOL. So, yeah. I mean, that's just maybe the crypto version of what an influencer is. But for my opinion, KOLs are people that do more than just talk about your project. They usually are helping you with branding or marketing or something else other than just talking about your project. And I think that's really important. Okay. Or at least that's what they should like, be doing. Because if you're a key opinion leader, that means you're a leader in this space. You're someone that people go to for your opinion because you have a lot of experience, just like someone would come to you and ask mm-hmm. about crypto law and how they can set something up properly without getting in trouble with the SEC. Like people go to K opinion leaders that have worked in this space with like, I've worked with over 50 projects. I can tell them what they shouldn't do. I can tell them what other people did and didn't work. I can tell them what other people did and did work, who they should work with that actually dumps tokens, who they should work with, who doesn't dump tokens. So like basically can avoid them a lot of stress from just knowing these are the good people to work with. These are the bad people to work with. These are the guys that they're going to do. They don't just talk about it. Mm-hmm. So that's in my opinion what a key opinion leader but the unfortunately 
Our space probably only has like 15 or 20 of us that are really true opinion, key opinion leaders who really can add value beyond just talking about the project. Because an influencer to me is someone who goes, hey, there's this new product, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to buy it because this, 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 and this, and it's going to moon, blah, and that's it, right? That's mainly what they're focusing on. Whereas I'm like, hey, this project could do really well, and here's why. Here's the fundamentals in the project. Here's how they bring liquidity to NFTs. Here's like... You know, their branding is on point. Their team has a lot of experience. So I go into like, why did I put my money in? And I usually tell people far before the actual launch of the project. So they're looking for it a month or three or four weeks before mm -hmm. the project even launches. So now they have like a little bit of insight and they can do some research and have time. Uh, and, and like, I don't do stuff like a day before it launches, right? I'm telling them and well, then I'm reminding fake, them. Right? If you do, if you do it the day before, it looks like you just made a fast deal. Yeah, exactly. And and not only that, it's like, if you tell them a day before it actually launches, they can't get an the IDO, they can't actually participate. And usually they're exit liquidity if they buy in because they don't know that people are going to get tokens. It's going to launch hard because too many people are talking about it. Uh, and I always tell people, like I posted something today where I was like, yeah, this token is going to have 100% liquidity on launch. I'm going to buy after all the GHG, meaning like when everyone sells all their tokens at the 100%, and I see it's bottoming out, I'm gonna buy then. And that's what I'm telling them so that they know I shouldn't just buy it on launch because all the tokens are gonna to be out. Someone's gonna be selling on that day, right? There's always someone who does it. So that way they can prepare themselves on like making a plan. And like I always tell people, if you fail the plan, you plan to fail. And in trading and in this stuff, it's very important because if you know when you're gonna sell, you know when you're gonna buy and just executing on, on like what you said you're gonna do, you can literally program the trade and walk away and just wait for it to hit, right? Like if it stops out, it's okay because you already planned to lose that 1% or half percent and then you're okay. So you're chilling. Uh, and I think that's that's the thing that's the hardest for people is like there's so much FOMO and there's so much emotion behind like trading and making money that like, oh my God, I gotta get in everything. My friend told me this is gonna moon. This is gonna go to, and you're like instantly like not even thinking, you're just acting and reacting and you're being impulsive. And that's why some people make crazy gains and they give them all back because they think they're a lot smarter. They just got lucky and they didn't have a plan and then they didn't have a plan on when to sell and, and or they sell too fast because they don't know how to actually like have a plan of when they're gonna sell, how much they're gonna sell. So like understanding all of those things before you even start, it, like you guarantee yourself to not get fucking wrecked. And like, sorry, I swear, my bad. You cut that part up. So you guarantee yourself I, 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 not to because get... I don't cut these videos. I I just upload them to YouTube okay. and spray and pray. So thank thanks for the pray pray. thanks for the strike. Yeah, sorry YouTube. Uh, it's okay. Swearing, I, I don't think it's it's so bad, but um, I think it, yeah, I'm, I'm real like this. Like, you'll notice copyright violation, but if you swear, they don't care. Yeah, you know, once in a while, you can bleep it out or something. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, the, you know, look, I, I get your point. L yeah. Let me ask you, what, by the way, as you, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know what, the, the difference between influencer and KOL is influencer is you're, you're kind of pitching a lifestyle or a brand. A, a KOL is, you're, it really is, you're pitching your opinion, not the, and the opinion is you know, everyone, you know, what, you know what they say about opinions, everyone has one like something else in your body. It's yep. almost, you want, you want to be a KIL, key intellectual leader. And th that result- I had uh, that name, man. It would be great because I hate the way people will perceive that that's all I do is KOL. That's how they know you. So they see your brand. They see you on, on, on you know, YouTube or Twitter. And they're like, that's all this guy does. So I'm just going to hit him up. How much for a video? How much for this? And I'm like, dude, like, I don't need money for this kind of stuff. I want to invest and I want to talk about my investments. So I'm not going to be paid off this way. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of them are like, what do you mean? You won't take 10 grand to do a video. I'm like, I mean, I will, like, if I really like your project and you're not going to let me get any tokens, sure. I'll take, I'll take a small amount once in a while and tell everybody about it when I do my video. But, you know, like I, I generally don't do that. I don't need the money. Right? I, I, so, I wouldn't sell your your brand for 10,000 for you. You got to be careful. Exactly. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like it's, it's something like if I already am working with your project, I'm if you're already working. You I'm want, sure. But yeah, like, but if you're like some random shit coin, it comes to me, I'm not going to come and be like, yeah, I'm going to work with you. Like I, I, I have enough people already asking me to work with them that I don't want too much more. Right. I try to like filter out a lot. And now I have a team that filters it out, pre-filters it for me. So I don't have to waste my time doing that. Cause I value my time so much more now than I do money. Like, you can always make more money, but time you don't have, right? You can't make more time. Your time goes and that's it. You can't buy more. So, you know, I'm into biohacking and other stuff to keep my time on the earth. Actually, you know, let's talk about that a little bit because you were, if you're okay with it, like the, of course, what does your location allow you to do? 
you, you said some stuff in the pre-interview. Maybe you want to share it. You, like what is happening? Sorry, you you cut out for a second. Sorry, what so is, what we, let's actually talk about the lifestyle thing because that's pretty interesting. And yeah, of course. Right now we're in the live recorded show. You know, just for the audience, we had a little pre-show conversation about this. There's some benefits to being in Phuket in terms of biohacking yeah. and living a designed life. Can you talk about what's available there? I mean, everything is available here. Great schools, good hospitals, Bangkok, if you need specialists, uh, have like an amazing- IVs, like, like that kind of stuff? That's what I was getting at. Yeah, so, you know, um, I got into IVs after I did stem cells because I was in so much pain. Uh, I couldn't focus. Like I couldn't sit here without moving every five seconds and being like super uncomfortable last cycle because I have compressed vertebrae and stuff. And I like did I like the crazy long needles into my spine didn't work. And then they're like, we're going to fuse your discs. And I, you know, I was way too young for people to, to let them do surgery on my neck. So I was like, no, absolutely not. Uh, found about, found out about stem cells, did stem cells literally like within six weeks, I had no pain anymore. And it was like, oh my God, I feel normal. No one even has to listen to me complain. Cause I don't have any pain anymore. Like, it's just great. My wife was like, you haven't complained for weeks. And I didn't even realize it. Cause when you're not in pain, you don't notice it. So yeah. And that was my walk into like, maybe I should learn more about this stuff because that same week you do stem cells, you do red light therapy, you do IVs, you do all sorts of great stuff. Uh, you do chelation, you get all the heavy metals out of your body, you do detox to get rid of like, you know. What is chelation? How, how does that work? Chelation is like, so they'll test your body to see how many heavy metals like aluminum and stuff like that from like doing uh, underarm, uh, uh, like using deodorants and stuff like that. Uh, and it will show you like, on a, on a scale, like where you are, like how much your, your metals are, how much metals are in your body. Uh, so if you smoke, you have carbonium and stuff. And so you have to like chelate that out of your body because heavy metals are bad to have it, the high ratios, because it affects your heart, your lungs, your liver, yeah. it affects how your brain functions. So, you know, you, know, you learn that and then you do that by tests, right? And then you do blood tests. I do one every three months, check everything from growth hormone levels, to testosterone to cancer markers. So like basically you, you try to find out where your health could be in jeopardy usually it's fine but it's like this is a little high this is a little low here take these supplements and do an iv for this your vitamin c is a little low your vitamin d is a little low most people think that they live in a hot sunny place that their vitamin d levels are going to be high enough it's actually wrong usually we always need it yeah like you well, only well, get vitamin also, depending on the environment if it's hot and sunny you may stay indoors i mean a lot of people dubai we live in our buildings and in, in the uber yep it's true so, you know, you get these things and you don't realize like when you have no, when you have low vitamin C, vitamin D, your hair starts falling out, your energy starts to drop, your bones can break easier. Vitamin C, your energy levels get totally wrecked. Like you're always tired all of a sudden. But I remember the first time I got a vitamin C. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I got my first vitamin C IV uh, and I swear to God, like within three minutes of it being in me, I was like, oh my God, I have so much energy. I was like raring to like go run around and stuff. Uh, and it made me realize like, oh, this stuff is really good. Like NAD as well, very good for the brain, uh, rejuvenating your body, like re rebuilding cells naturally, um, you know, and it builds okay. up in your body and it's good to have in there. So like these type of things, like I've been teaching people about that are in my circle because your health is wealth. It's more important than money. If you're not healthy, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It's still not going to be a good day. So I always tell people like focus on how to not get sick in the first place. So that's where like peptides come in, right? So peptides like epithalin stop you from 50% less chance of getting like dementia and Alzheimer's and heart disease. And basically like all this stuff that like you have a lot of stomach problems in your, in your family and you've always got stomach problems and you eat certain foods, you take BCP 157 and TB4 and all of a sudden you don't have stomach problems anymore. I know people that used to throw up every time they eat, they start taking BPC 157 and their stomach completely normal now and they don't ever get sick. Like they feel so much better. Uh, also, it helps you heal if you break bones. Mm -hmm. So, and these things are branch chains of amino acids. They're not steroids. They're not like stuff that's going to harm your body. It actually helps you not get sick in the first place. So, preventative health care. So, how do I not get cancer in the first place? How do I not get dementia? How do I not get heart disease or get diabetes or get over or, or things like Ozempic? We're also for for people who eat too much and they basically get really really overweight. It helps you not eat as much because you get full faster, right? Because it's a Which gastro one? inhibitor. There's two, there's one called um, semenoglutide and the other one's called uh, trizepatide. Okay. Most people know it as Ozempec. Many people know because yeah, yeah, was taking it. Um, so those two are, are gastro inhibitors. So they stop you from feeling, they make you feel full for a lot longer. 
So you're, you're basically, you're slow, your, your digestive tract down a bit. So when you eat, you're full, you're full and you're full for a long time. You don't want to eat all the time. Let, let me ask you about that long, the last one, because I've seen people, you seem to have very drawn faces, maybe a little bit too much. Like their faces. Oh, like they're losing thin. too much weight. Yeah, they they look. It's it's not like a healthy lean. I, I, and I think it, I think it was that last one, Ozempic, whatever you call it. I'm like Ozempic. Yeah, it's like I'm, there's you, there's you, a new one. Like, fine. I'm talking about. I, I've seen a couple of people that they lost a lot of weight, but it, it didn't look like a healthy weight loss. It looked like they're drawn or, or too much. Well, if you take it for too long, it's bad, right? So it's like everything has to be like I do everything with a doctor. Like I have two doctors actually, so. I, I know that like when I'm at a goal for my weights, I don't need to take that stuff anymore. I can go off of that for a while. I can eat what I want again. I go to the gym and then I, I feel fine, right? So I think it's about really a balance, right? That stuff can help you if you've never been able to lose weight, to lose weight. And then, you know, it help, It also makes you lose muscle. So there's there's not only like all good, there could be risk with that. If you take it for a long period of time and you don't ever go to the gym, you start losing muscle. So you're losing, you look like you're skinnier, but you're actually losing muscle, which isn't good. So yeah. it's it's like again, everything, has to be, everything has to be monitored by a doctor. You can't just go and take this stuff out of, off the shelf and, and do it. But like, if you're doing it under the right controls, you can be so much healthier and you can feel so much better every day and you reduce your risk of all the things that kill most of the people. Heart mm -hmm. disease and cancer kill most people, right? Like those two things and obesity. If you take away those three things, the chance of you having problems with your body are much, much less than before. And then if you have things like problems with uh, your kidneys or your liver, there's ways like with different types of IVs to help those things get back into controllable ranges when you're not going to get sick where you're not going to have to get a, you know, your kidneys out of whack and start getting to the point where like, oh, you're having a problem now. So they can track all this through your blood, right? They don't even need to do anything but blood tests. And then they do the, the palm test for the heavy metals. And if you keep all that in, in range, you'll stay healthy for a lot longer. You won't get sick. Like when all my friends get sick, I don't get sick. And when I get sick, I get sick for one or two days and I feel better. Mm -hmm. Whereas like during, during last year, um, there was the ice factory had like a problem in Phuket. There was E. coli in one of them. And like mm -hmm. every one of my friends, including me, got sick. But I got sick for like a day and a half and then I was fine. All my friends were sick for like a week and a half. And the only difference between me and them was I was taking peptides and they weren't. Actually, I, so, I got a question because I'm speaking of ex-family, the what was Phuket like during COVID? And did you get it? Awesome. It was great. It was great. Like uh Bangkok was like, oh my God, it was terrible. Like they always wore masks in Bangkok, but it was like it was like really hardcore. Phuket was like half the people weren't wearing masks. No one really cared. Um, you know, the south of Thailand was kind of like, you know, a lot less woke, I guess, than the rest of the world. So everyone was like, you come here and you'll you'll talk to people. You'd be like, did you get vaxxed? They're like, nope. <laughs> I would say like 80% of the people I know here never got a vaccine. Um, so they weren't really forced into the corner the same way as other places. So a lot of people I knew who were in Dubai left and came to Thailand for that reason. Um and it's funny. Yeah, I, I left Los Angeles and went to Dubai. <laughs> Dubai was good too, but they forced people to get the, the vaccine, which if you were working there. So I have friends that were working there that moved here and now they're they're here for good, I guess. I don't know. They're not leaving anytime soon. But Phuket's such a great lifestyle. Like if you work online, you don't need to go and to an office building in Wall Street, all that bull crap. You could dress really comfortable, work from your computer, you know, have your calls. You know, do all your business on like five screens. So like do all your business, do everything you need to do um, and operate. Like Speaking you don't screen. need to be, oh uh, man, I got a lot. Oh yeah, you got six. So I got like one up here, two down here, one there. Um, I split it into five basically. And so I have like five to be screens. Honest, this is more than I need. I, and you know, to, to be super honest, I, I'm usually seeing the desk that you're seeing me at, but this one's got the standing electrical thing going yeah, on. I got the ergonomic room. too. Well, it's good do. to stand sometimes. It's good yeah. for your back. You a man on his feet is worth two on his seat. Was that? A man on his feet is worth two on their seat. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. So, okay. There's so the, like, one thing we also talked about before we started recording is, you know, yeah, yeah, you are a, I don't even want to call you KOL. I, I actually don't even like that term. You, you are someone who has had an impact and a following in the industry. And people, yes, people see you a certain way, but you've also produced a lot of good. But you, you, your plans 
for the next couple of cycles. You you have your not not your exit, but maybe you know what do you call it? Your 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 lead, you're going to orbit. Have, or, you know whatever you're yeah. taking, whatever you want to call it. I have my stepping stone. Like you know, I, I feel like most people don't set goals for themselves, which is why they kind of stay where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been like, I, if I know I want to do something, there's no one else stopping me but me. And that's like the same with anything in life. Like everyone limits themselves. Like, yes, I'm a coach too, because I do this for a lot of people and I help them understand that like the reason why you didn't start a business is because you told yourself you couldn't do it. Like every, everyone has a reason why they don't do something. A lot of the time it's their own fault that they don't do it. So I was always the type of person, and I don't know if it's just like a crypto thing, but a lot of us have this personality. Like, if we're going to do something, we're going to go and do it. And like, I'll fail at it. I don't mind. I don't care if I fail. So, you know, my next goal now, I've made 100 people millionaires. I was like, what's the next thing I want to do? In this cycle, it's been really intense already, <laughs> you know? So it's like, what do I do next in life? What's the next big goal? And I figured, you know, this cycle took on trust money and I'm trading it and I'm crushing it. This cycle, like I've made him over $20 million of profit already for this guy. And he's really happy. Um, you know, and we've started talking to other people at Satoshi and other places like that. And you know, I was telling them my strategy and I was showing them like my gains and they were like, Holy shit, like you could be a fund manager. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of my next goal. So after the end of the cycle, you know, I want to put like my own startup, my own startup fund, like my own funding for the, for the fund. I'll put in like 20 sure. mil to start. And then I'm going to have other people come in, um, high, high check, high check value. So it's not like, you know, not just small money from a bunch of people that are going to bother me every day, but more like, you know, someone has 10 mil here, you do it for me and just get like 50 investors like that. And then they'll know I have my own money in there. So they know I'm not going to try to be fun. Own. Yeah. I want to do a large fund. And I think the way I do my strategy, had I had 500 mil this cycle, it would have been perfect for this, the strategy I'm running right now. Because like there's so much liquidity in the coins that I'm, I'm focused on that you don't have to worry about exits. Like you invest in VC tokens that have a million dollars liquidity. You can't exit if you have a million dollars of token value. Like you could drive it to zero, but well, you can't. Like, you can't issue, actually, right? Yeah, it's tons, there's tons of issues like that. And very few projects, unless they're there ones, there are twos, are going to have that type of liquidity their first cycle. So for me, I'm, I have a very different mindset where I trade off the secondary market most of the capital. And knowing that if I'm buying Bitcoin at 17,000, like I did this cycle, and you're up almost 300%, I mean, that beats almost every traditional fund in the whole entire world in a, in a year, like in two years, it's been a year, it's January 7th, 2023. So it's been 15 months. And if I only my Bitcoin buy is all I did, you'd be up 300%. I guarantee you anyone would give me money if they could do that. It's like, it's not something that... Maybe if you're a crypto you, guy, you're like, well, that's fucking easy, like a you know, question but... that everyone would ask, which is, are you maybe over concentrated in Bitcoin? No, absolutely not. I, I have assets. I have, I control about 140 assets in crypto. So I have 140 different investments. Obviously there's some that are bigger than others, but um, you know, I have, I have a chunk in ETH and Bitcoin and then a lot of other layer ones like DOT, EGLD, Atom, NIR, KDA, HBAR, Phantom, Algo, AD, uh, Quant. AVAX, Matic, VMB, Rune, Theta, Link, Anchor, Arweave, uh, World Mobile Token, Eternity. Um, I, I crushed my AI. My AI basket destroyed it. Like Ajax, Ocean, Vet, FET, RLC, and GRT. Those have done really, really, really well. Um, and so I just focused on stuff that was 100 mil minimum uh, total market cap with at least like 5 to 10 mil in volume a day. So that's how I figured out where I'm going to put the capital and how much. Obviously, larger amounts of market cap would get more into the bear market uh, as we bottomed out. And then it was just like, okay, now just wait for the market to come back. And we saw Bitcoin first and ETH, and then other things started to catch up now. And I think we haven't even started the, the real bull market yet. No, that's, I, that's don't think so. I, I think we're pre. Yeah. We're pre. People are starting to search. Have for anyone to get off? What, what do you think? Yeah, I think the having will will definitely kick it off. And I think going into the having, people have different. I believe we're going to have a pullback. We started it already. I think we'll have a pullback closer to 60 at some point, um, which would kind of reset us fully. And then we can start to go higher. And most of the time, right before the bull market, uh, before the halving, the real true bull market would start, uh, you get a little dip in the markets and then we kind of go up. Sometimes we go straight up, but generally there's like an event. We've had a couple of liquidation events in the last few weeks where billions of dollars are liquidated from over leveraged. I think they're going to keep doing that for right now because there's too much leverage. And then once that kind of settles down and that funding rates kind of get a little bit lower again, 
then we'll have the next start of the run because everyone just thinks it's going to elevate her up and, and it's not healthy. I like seeing the pullbacks. It makes me confident in the market more. And also it gives us all, all, all the people who are coming in now opportunities to buy, right? Like if you're yes, somebody who's been waiting on the sideline, you, 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 you need volatility. Yeah, otherwise no one can make money. <laughs> like the markets need to go up and they need to go down. Um, and the faster they go up, the faster they come, they come down faster than they go up. So they go up really, really hard and fast and you don't sell. It's going to come down really fast too as well. So to have well, consolidation. So another question. Are, are you a believer in the stock to flow model? I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but do I believe it? I never really believed in a lot of the models. I just look at the charts and it tells me a lot of the time. I look at... The cycles, I don't think we're going to have different cycles. Every, every time I've been, every cycle I've been in, it's this time, it's going to be different. This time, it's, last time it was super cycle. Now they're saying it's a left-handed cycle. And I'm just going, you know what? It's not. It's doing the exact same thing that I was projecting. The only thing is the ETF is different. So Bitcoin went higher faster because all these institutions who sat on the sideline for years, now we're like, we can buy it. So they're buying Bitcoin, which pushes the price higher. And they're buying Bitcoin right before we're going to have only like, uh, right now it's what, like at 60, at 60, 70 K, there's about 56 mil a day, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're only doing $56 million of, of mining and there's $300 million of buying on, on average a day, uh, and then once GBTC stops selling, because it's just people that are getting their money out from the bankruptcies, mm -hmm. uh, it's just going to make the market go higher. Like it's simple. Everyone wants Bitcoin. There's not enough. The supply crunch is here that we've been talking about for 10 years, right? Yep. And then Ethereum's going to have an ETF. So I'm very like stacking the ETH because I think with ETH having a diminishing reply, uh, supply as it keeps dropping every day because it's burning more than it's producing from, from Lido and all those guys, uh, with that happening, that ETH, if we have an ETF, BlackRock and everyone else is looking for what's next because this one already went up 300% or 200%, right? So they're going, okay, what's next? So next though, will be likely ETH. So I think it's going to go to like 10, 12, 15,000 this cycle. I think we'll see five-figure ETH this, uh, this cycle for sure. I think so too. The, um, yeah. And then stepping back from from the investment perspective, just on the societal side, what do, what do you see blockchain and crypto accomplishing? Do you, and do you see them interacting with other technologies or industries? Like put put on your well, future we're cap. It. Well, we're we're seeing it already. We see like with AI, right? We're seeing that it's integrating. They're trying to. I mean, there's a lot of scammy AI projects with people who don't understand the tech are really going to get caught into it. But in general. AI and crypto make a lot of sense because everything's on chain. So AI can actually learn from what people are doing, what wallets are doing. And there are projects that are focusing a lot on looking at all the influencers, what they're all saying, when they're saying it, what impact they have on price. All this kind of stuff is being done right now. There's a project that I invested into, uh, which is doing that specifically where they're looking at all the KOLs that are invested in projects. And when they tweet, and then it looks at all the tweets that they're doing and how much impact they have. And then it buys. So this is a bot just buys based off when they're all tweeting the same projects. Wow. And it's crushing. It's making so much money, this pro this bot, because it, it's so easy to spot the trend when there's all these opinions of people who everyone love saying the same thing about a project. So they that's like one way. Um, you know, you're seeing stuff like data sharing, data availability, uh, becoming big deep in projects as well. Uh, you know, there's... But Pantera, and there's Pantera and one other fund I read like uh, in one of their emails that were saying that's where they're focusing now is deep in projects because they, they think that's going to be big. That's kind of like what World Mobile, um, mm -hmm. Get Grass, all these guys are doing is sharing the data, right? Sharing like if I'm not at home and I have a bunch, I have a thousand up, thousand down internet and I'm not using it really, then, you know, I could share that inter with, net with someone else's, right, on a network and then they can get some of the speed and then they can you know, basically, uh, they can basically pay me for faster internet through the network, right? Yes. It, so that's like, that's one thing, like, where else it's going to integrate, I don't really know. I don't think social fi is really going to be a thing. I've always said this, maybe we'll find a new Twitter, or a new Instagram or a new something. I just don't think on Twitter, because the spot analysis, which most people don't do, when you look at the threat, the threat is Elon tomorrow goes, you know what? We're just going to add a new crypto called to X token. And instantly the whole entire business of all these other companies are, are dead because they just now go on chain and your, your company is completely going to have a, the biggest, the biggest uh, threat is that Elon and Facebook and all these guys just make their own token. So I think it's not really a great place to focus on, but I do think deep in anything with sharing data, 
Um, and AI definitely is something I've been focusing on. Uh, I think this cycle, we're going to see DEXs take over a lot of sex volume. Um, and then the other thing is... That would be great. I think this, it's it's already happening a little bit, slowly. Slowly. And we're seeing it, it, fragmentation. I thought DeFi summer was the, was, was the summer for that, but... I don't know. I, I, I We'll see. We'll definitely see. So, you know, I really think that all the DEXs and all this stuff, I think it has to kind of go when it's focused on just one chain. I do believe Omnichain is the real future because the second I can have a game and I don't have to have a BSC wallet, I can have any wallet and I can play this game or like that industry, the gaming side is going to be absolutely massive. Like I've worked with Godzilla for two and a half years. Uh, we're with Co Cornucopias. I uh, worked with Veracity early on and those projects have sustainability because there's so many users that everyone plays games. So if you can bring in ecosystems of people who play games and it feels like they're they're playing a game, it doesn't feel like crypto. I think the true nature of where crypto needs to go is what ha how Amazon works or how Google works. I have Google Drive, I have Google Mail, I have Meets, I have all these things that I can use. But I don't know how the tech works on the back end. I don't care if it's blockchain tech, Web2 tech, uh, you know, IFPS or whatever. It, it doesn't really matter. Like, no one gives a shit. All, all we care about is, can I use this? Does it make it cheaper? Does it make it faster? Does it make it easier? If you have and two is it integrated? Things, yeah, and it's integrated. So I don't need to know it's a blockchain. And if we have Omnichain in the background, something that connects all the chains, the new ones and the old ones together, where I could just buy something and a wallet that's one wallet, that I know is secure, that if I bought ETH on this chain or ETH on any chain, it just shows up an ETH in one wallet instead of changing our PCs. Like these kinds of things are what I'm looking for for the future. Because once we have one wallet, it could be a hundred different wallets, but wallets that literally have one asset, no matter where what chain they're on, it just shows you it there and automatically will aggregate it and send it to another chain, whichever one you want to sell on. That's going to solve like the biggest problem, which is the confusion of all the different blockchains. That or we're going to have fragmentation and everyone's going to choose one or two chains. And they're not going to invest in all of them um, because it just makes it easier. Because right now it's so hard to, to keep up with every chain, all the projects, all the DeFi projects, all the... You know, this is my next crazy. question, which is, you know a ton and you're yeah. leading a whole group and you got a family and you're doing all this other stuff. How do you keep up? How do I keep up? Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you uh, stay current and know what you know? uh man i don't i don't even know how i do it to be honest like i've i've had uh, i have a project i'm working with right now and they were like oh yeah like gonna come on and I, I made like 40 groups in it in like three days with different people i know and they're like man how do you do all this and i'm just like i don't even know how i do it myself i just know when i'm motivated to do something and get stuff done and do it quick and efficiently i have a team of people as well who help me so you know i have like four people on my team they do stuff like helping me with tweeting, helping me with other stuff. So it's not always just me. And now I'm actually looking to expand my team. So like people, other people to do YouTube uh, videos on my channel and sharing the sharing the, the profitability or just using the network and building on a network around kind of like what Banter did, where like get a, a couple more people around me doing the same thing, understand the knowledge, add value to other people, um, and then kind of give them some of the some of the responsibilities so that I can focus on that. And then on the weekends. I always take the weekends off. So I used to do like during COVID, I would work like all the time and I burnt out super hard. I learned that I need like a Saturday for myself and a Sunday with the kids and the family. I see my kids every day because I work from home. So that's that's a blessing because otherwise I'd probably never see them that much. Uh, but then I get my couple hours with them every day. Uh, and, you know, then we can talk and do whatever. But I try to balance it as best I can. No, it's, there's no such thing as perfect balance. That's the reality. Uh, it's just doing your best. The goal for me now is to get to the point where I run a fund and take away some of these responsibilities that I have with like working with all the different projects and hand them off to other people who are capable and make them a part of the team, not make them an employee and let them make profit from helping me. And like you share the wealth with everyone and then everyone makes, you know, you, you basically have this amazing team and you let them have a piece of everything. Whereas most companies are like, oh yeah, work for me, here's $5,000 a month. I'm like, well, I'll give you a salary so you can eat but I'm also going to give you percentages of all these different things if you help me with them. And then you can benefit yourself and your family. And that's kind of my methodology. And like some people think that's wrong because like, why would you give away all this stuff? You, you I don't, I don't think it's wrong. I think it, you, that's how you get people thinking outside the box, the right people. I want people to be feeling like they don't have a boss where they're motivated to do it for themselves because they know at some point I'm going to hand off things.
to say, here, this is yours now. I'm still going to get something out of it, but like, you're going to get a huge chunk of what I used to get. You run it. Like I, I don't, I can be hands off. I'll bring you projects. You guys know how I operate everything. You've worked with me for four or five years now. You know everything to do. Now you can do it. You don't have to worry about money. You're going to make enough to live and be very comfortable. So then I let them cut, but then I can focus on doing like a bigger picture thing. Um, and I really want to get into entertainment and stuff like that after. So like be fund manager and then go into entertainment are like the two next steps that I want to do. Cause I, I really like making people laugh and like, you know, just, just doing things that are fun. And, and I'm really good at planning stuff. I did my own conference last year in May. Um, it was, so at was that in Phuket or what, where was that? It was in Phuket. Yeah, we did. It, it was called the coach K experience. We brought in a bunch of like, uh, the big projects and this time, like, cause I was at Satoshi, everyone wants to come from Satoshi. So we're going to have like a top, top, top class of people. And then nice. the goal this time is I got some celebrity connections now to bring in a few celebrities so that there can be mingling with the top people in crypto from like every facet of the industry, but bring in some celebrities that also want access, but they always get celebrities always get into the scammiest projects. We've seen this happen over and over again. So give them a network as well. And then also like it benefits everybody. So kind of intermingling like entertainment and crypto is also very important. And I learned that with Eternity when we worked with like Messi and we were working with like Fernando Tatis Jr. and a bunch of like celebrities and athletes and musicians and stuff. I saw like they bring a lot of people into the space because people love them and their community is similar as KOL, right? So if we can empower them, they can make more money because musicians and athletes and celebrities, a lot of them don't make more money than people in crypto, to be honest. So they want access. They want to learn uh, how to do what we do. And there's some really smart celebrities and athletes that are in crypto. Like uh, it was Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of New York Giants, takes half of his salary in Bitcoin since he was on since he was in Green Bay. And like, I'm sure that was an incredible decision. He's probably made so much money from that. But that just shows you like there's definitely some interest there. So I want to kind of integrate a little bit more of that. Um, so just, you know, just, just because we're, 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 as usual, you know, I'm going twice the expected time because you're awesome. In one <laughs> sentence, what is your Phuket conference about? I didn't quite catch it. In one sentence, the point is to take away the boring part of the conference and do things that are actually fun together. So building relationships, your network is your net worth. We all go to conferences like Dubai 2049, and we all get totally bored and bombarded by people that generally are not going to be of super value to us. Yes. And we never get a chance to talk to each other because there's always so many people talking to you. So the value I usually get from these conferences, I go on yachts with 100 people that I already know are going to be very valuable people. We can help each other and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, I realized that I go to all these conferences. I don't want to be at the conference. I want to be around the people to build stuff and change and innovate the space. So the only way to do that is to bring people somewhere for five days where they're not in a rush to friggin' meet everybody in the room and build a relationship. And so instead of taking you and sitting you in a conference room, listening to people who you already know, who you already understand what they're talking about at a very high level, you can sit on a yacht and have like side quests chats about everything it turns into a mini conference but now we're on a yacht or going chats. yeah so you know it's kind of like satoshi roundtable does like the unconference format where you kind of even that's too much for me i think we don't need to force anyone to go and listen to talk we just need to put them together and they're going to talk about crypto because they're all crypto everyone loves talking about crypto right so um you know getting them that opportunity to do a short workshop at the event where everyone can kind of explore and, and get some conversation flowing and then the rest of the time do fun activities, do parties, do all their stuff where you actually enjoy yourself. Get a massage with someone, talk while you're just getting your massage, whatever it is. Have meetings at the at the resort. All those things are paid for. So it's like one cost. You pay for everything. You can do anything you want. It's like really. I, open... I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. You got me. You got yeah. me jazzed up. All right. But Joel, my friend, yeah. we went double my a lot of time, but just because you're, you're all awesome. Right. <laughs> and I appreciate you taking the time. I want to say thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I want us to stay more in touch than we did in the past. You know, everything happens when yeah, we're supposed to. I, I don't I don't mind that stuff takes time. But, you know, I think, you know, fate brought us back into the conversation with each other. And I think what you're doing is amazing. I love that. I love, love, love the education angle that, that speaks yeah. to my soul. I think that's great. And I, and I love that you're love you're managing it, being a, a KOL, heaven forbid I use that term, with integrity. You know, God bless you. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for taking the time. I'm going to stop the recording, but I want you to know I appreciate you. I'll, I'll, I'm grateful for you doing this. Thank you for what you do in the industry as well. You're an OG. Yes. Thank you. I, Joel said I'm an OG. I'm happy. I'm 